I want to say a word, not about his topic, not about his biography, Good. just a word or two about the similarities between Micah's approach and the approach of the Episcopal Church, because it's it's found in our um, the similarities of approaches between the Episcopal Church and Anglicanism. And Micah's synagogue, and Micah is studied and trained in Reform Judaism, and Anglicanism and Reform Judaism has many similarities. When I was in seminary 18 years ago, I read a book by a major theologian named Keith Ward, who's well published by Oxford. And he said in his book, Religion and Revelation, that he compared Reform Judaism and Anglicanism. That didn't make a whole lot of sense to me until I met Micah. And, and when I met Micah, it all dawned on me what Keith Ward was talking about in this book. Ward says that what's similar between Anglicanism and Reformed Judaism in terms of scripture and revelation is this. Both traditions simply reject that God reveals God's self to us through dictation. Hmm. That is that God from on high, or wherever God may be, simply says it, and some person, you know, the way dictation works, simply writes it down in Hebrew or Greek or whatever. That God does not communicate in such a simple, one-to-one -one manner. Instead, both of our traditions see that God reveals God's self through a complex conversation. And any time that revelation takes place, it takes place in a dense format. So, for example, when you look at the scriptures... Our scriptures are made up of many different genres, many different writers, many different contexts, and all of it is in creative tension. We move literally as we listen to the scriptures. We move back and forth from things like dreams to laws, things like visions to wisdom sayings. They're so concrete pieces of history that we want to honor and protect to really heady, more philosophical ideas about the mystery of God. And all of these different genres, all of these different voices are in the mix. And what Keith Ward eventually advocates for, over four volumes, is what he calls comparative theology. That in the contemporary world, religions need to be engaged in comparative theology, which he says is an open and dynamic conversation that is loyal both to critical thought and to our various traditions. It holds critical thought, the mind, in tension with these received texts that we have. And that, Micah, is one of the biggest reasons why I think we love being with you. There's a sense that when Micah is with us, he's talking more than we are. But there's a real sense in which we are in a conversation not only with him, with his entire tradition, and it is in your presence that we learn a lot more about who God is. And there's a sense that we can't do it without you. And our parish certainly cannot do it without your synagogue. God bless you, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> what Richard just shared is... The follow-up to our side conversation after the last two sessions on truth and beauty, um, I, I said to him, I feel like we're kindred spirits and my father of blessed memory who was a great rabbi always told me that there are two colleagues you will feel a particular affinity to. One, for ethnic reasons, will be the Greek Orthodox priests. Because Judaism has food, language, dance, its own version of Spanakopita. <laughs> so I used to joke with Father Nick Viron that we should have made a movie called My Big Fat Jewish Greek Wedding. <laughs> And then my dad, who was also a PhD and a thinker, said, and you are going to come to know Episcopal priests who will be your intellectual and spiritual brothers, 
and their people will live just like your flock in your reformed congregation. They will think similarly, critically, love God. They'll do everything but go to a different place when it comes to worship. And it's true. So I, I really appreciate you sharing that and explaining why it is that uh, Reformed Jews and Episcopalians think so much alike. Happy Mother's Day. You know, when we talk about goodness, <clears throat> I'm reminded of the book of Proverbs where it says, one who has found a good spouse has found the essence of goodness. When we talk about this word goodness, as I did with truth and beauty, we have to define what we mean. It's good that the Grizzlies won last night. But yes. But that has nothing to do with goodness. Right? When the Jewish people in our shared scripture are called an or la goyim, is the original Hebrew, a light unto the nations. What does it mean? Well, it means, according to our critical interpreters, basing it on scripture and reason and history. It means that we are supposed to help teach the world two lessons. One, that there is a God. And two, that God's primary demand is goodness. That God's primary demand, if you want to state it differently, is ethical behavior. Because Jews, Christians, Muslims are supposed to be ethical monotheists. Not monotheists, that's never enough according to Judaism to say you believe in one God. But ethical monotheism, the belief in one God who cares most about one thing, the way we treat each other. And the belief in one God who cares most about the way we treat one another holds that belief in God breeds goodness. A belief in God does not necessarily guarantee goodness, especially if it is accompanied, or rather unaccompanied, by ethical standards. And that's what we might say we're seeing with extreme expressions of religion, the extremists, most notably what's raging in the Muslim world. Those killers of all faiths who are extremists, but we'll stay with ISIS as an example, believe in Allah, believe in Allah, but it doesn't matter. If you believe in one God, it's whether it's accompanied by ethical standards. Nothing guarantees goodness. But the death of God, the outright denial of God, ultimately guarantees the triumph of evil. And we saw that in the 20th century. There is bad religion. We need to admit it like bad science. There's good religion and bad religion. There's good science and bad science. And in the 20th century, all the isms that declared war on God, Nazism, communism, is this working? I'm sorry. It went out? Test? Well, are we back? No? Are we back? Yes. Not really? I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Where's the hand? I use the handheld. The battery's out, I guess, huh? But where's the handheld? Uh, sure. Why don't I use that? Okay. There you go. Sure. That's fine. 
So I was saying all the isms of the 20th century declared war on God when you think about it. Fascism, Nazism, communism. <laughs> so while religion gets picked on, and it deserves to be picked on when it's unaccompanied by goodness, my friend and teacher Dennis Prager raises the following hypothetical situation. You're lost in downtown Memphis. Don't ask, but it can happen. You're going down one of those alleys, uh, like the Rendezvous or other parts of South Maine. You're alone. You thought your car was around the corner, but you end up going down an alley. Ten big, burly men are approaching you in this dark alley late last night you accidentally happen upon. Just one question. Would it or would it not make you feel better to know that they had just come from an evening Bible study class? <laughs> In our Episcopal and, as Richard introduced, Reformed Jewish tradition, uh, the crucial God question is what does God want me to do? How do my actions reflect God and help me to become the best me possible? How do my actions reflect the goodness of God? That's the way we demonstrate how the content of our lives has any real significance, whether we're 13 or 93. I know that this is a, a busy time of year uh, with graduations and achievement deserves distinction. But one thing I hope is heard at commencement addresses uh, is what often is not said and that is being smart and being good do not necessarily have anything to do with one another. Most of Hitler's henchmen had PhDs, graduate degrees. There's a shortage in the world today of good people, of people who are praised for their goodness. I've often pointed out to parents that it's easier to find a good doctor today than to find a great person, a person of goodness, integrity, honesty, total decency. Some of them happen to be doctors. But when I used to um, visit my grandmother of blessed memory in Miami Beach, her friends used to show off pictures of their grandchildren. They would say, this is my grandson, the doctor. This is my granddaughter, the lawyer. None would say, this is a picture of my granddaughter, one of the kindest, most decent, good people you'll ever meet. Goodness is much worthier and a more satisfying goal than doing well. Because to achieve goodness requires a willingness to make a difference in the lives of others and in the world, to give something of oneself to others. Um, at my alma mater, uh, I had an advisor who I rarely saw. Like we, I had a course in an education school, and I was absolutely captivated by this scholar teacher I could barely touch. Uh, and he, his name was Robert Coles. He's a renowned child um, psychiatrist and professor. This was in the mid '80s. I was there from 84 to 86. And um, a graduating Harvard student had dropped by his office, an undergraduate senior, and I was in graduate school. And he went to Dr. Cole's office for psychological counseling. And the student, this is reported by Dr. Cole's to us. The student began the session by telling Dr. Cole's that his grades had arrived and that he had earned two A's 
in advanced courses in moral reasoning and philosophy, but that he was extremely depressed by the news. Dr. Coles was puzzled by the student's confession. Why are you depressed on account of earning two A's, Professor Coles asked. Moral reasoning and philosophy at Harvard are among the most difficult courses offered to undergraduates. The graduating senior replied, I'm disappointed and depressed because while I managed to get straight A's in moral reasoning, I'm not a very good person. In fact, I've done some pretty rotten things. Well, Coles putting on his psychiatry hat suggested to the student that he was being too hard on himself. But the student didn't take to Coles' pep talk. As the student began confessing some of the corrupt things he had done, Coles came to the conclusion that indeed this young man had good reason to feel bad. <laughs> so unable to think of anything further to say, Dr. Coles turned to the student and asked, so how may I be of help to you? What brought you to me? And the student replied, before I graduate, I just want one professor to agree with a straight A Harvard senior that education doesn't make anyone good. Harvard has made me smarter but not good. And the ironic part of all this, added the student, is that a Harvard education, and that for that matter, all degrees, liberal arts in particular, used to be about building character. Now, they're about one thing, making grades. I was moved when I heard this story because of its powerful and poignant truth. We often focus on intellect and performance instead of today's topic, goodness and character. And for that distinction between intellect and character, the, the distinction between how well we think and how well we behave, we have our Judeo-Christian heritage to thank. Whether it's Episcopals and Reformed Jews, I think it's fair to say both Jews and Christians do not devalue the life of the mind. But we both agree that knowledge and with Episcopalians and Jews, I'd say all Jews, knowledge and belief even are not enough. The aim of knowledge and study according to our faiths is to shape one's life and actions. The aim of our faith is the refinement of human beings. But the bold idea here even enters the realm of belief that perhaps what God cares about most is not that we believe what is right, but that we do what is right no matter what we believe. So if we do goodness, that matters more than whatever we profess to believe as Christians, Jews, others. Focusing on our inner lives is only a means to a greater end, isn't it? The only reason to improve our inner lives is if doing so leads us to improve the world beyond these walls and beyond ourselves. The premise of our faith is a big idea. 
an idea which perhaps sums up the essence and higher purpose of Christianity and Judaism. And it's an idea I hope you can embrace too. In one sentence, God is goodness and wants us to add to the goodness in the world. Now, I know how beautiful predicate theology can be. Predicate theology is where God is and you fill in the blank. Love, compassion, mercy, kindness, justice. But goodness has to be first. Because if it isn't first, it falls below something else. That is, there are many people who say, I love you, and do very mean things, hurtful things. Now, you could say that's not truly love, but if you follow that through, it means that they're not practicing goodness. God wants us to add to the goodness, not just of our lives, but to the goodness of the world. And I think that explains, looking at the display, and as I mentioned last week, I love walking into your sanctuary for my own private reflection, even if there's cat food on the altar. <laughs> but why is that? It explains why Grace St. Luke's partners with a larger community of faith beyond our own walls. I had our senior graduation Sabbath on Friday night and the kids were talking about more than a meal, which you made possible for them. We partner because we believe that coalitions of goodness and decency are why we're in this world. Coalitions of goodness and decency are, are the answer to the prayers you'll offer at services following this, or I don't know, in your place, is the early service smaller in my place it is, or those who already have offered those prayers. But the coalitions of goodness are the answer. If we don't grow in goodness in some way, then our souls begin to atrophy, just like our muscles when we don't use them. Or to put it in religious terms, how meaningful can your life really be if your goodness is not expanding? If you know better tomorrow or next year than you were today. I don't think I said this, uh, I've ever said this at your sister church downtown that has the Lenten series. Um, but. I'm always fascinated, you know, when I'm at the waffle shop and people tell me what they're giving up for Lent and uh, they joke that it's the only place we can gain weight during Lent uh, is, is the waffle shop. But um, I met people who gave up eating chocolate during Lent. Um, and after getting to know them better, they're very angry. What about giving up their anger? How does not eating cake expand your goodness? Anger is the poison that eats you from the inside, which is why giving up anger can expand your goodness. So we come back to this big idea that perhaps God wants us to add to the goodness of this world. Um, now, the rabbis said that you have to learn to see properly to expand your goodness. And there are two kinds of seeing in this world. There's the kind of seeing that happens when you open your eyes and look at the world, which is in itself a great miracle, because most of the time we don't look. And if we look, most of us don't see. So it's a miracle when we can see and look and see the beauty of the world as we discussed last week and see what truth really means. 
But the second kind of seeing, the rabbi said, is seeing the world with the eyes of goodness and joy. And you can only do this first with our eyes closed. Because when our eyes are closed, we see what the world can be instead of looking around and seeing disappointment and badness and all the things that are wrong. And there's so many. But maybe if we begin with our eyes closed and think about this idea that no matter what I'm going to see when my eyes are open, that first I, I want to see the potential, not just for myself, but for those around me, for the community, for the world God calls us to repair and heal and help and bring more goodness into the world. And when you start with that view, it influences how you see everything, including scripture. Let me go right to the chapter in our Bible that has had more books, sermons, ink spilled to demonstrate this idea. Genesis 22, the binding of Isaac. God tested Abraham. But it's not the test as conventionally understood. It was a test, looking at it the way I'm presenting this morning, it was a test of Abraham's willingness to obey without questioning what is good. You recall that God speaks twice to Abraham. Once telling him to take the boy's life and a second time telling him not to touch or even think of laying a hand on the child. The goodness test, as interpreters from my tradition view the story, is to see if Abraham will be able to distinguish the true voice of God, goodness, from the inauthentic one of impulse and blind obedience? Will he be wise enough to know that the call to conscience and compassion is the authentic voice of God, and the call to sacrifice is the verb we use, but to kill an innocent child is a distortion? And never mind Abraham, have we learned to recognize God's true voice amid the clamor of so many voices claiming to speak for God? Will we have absorbed the spirit and message of our scripture which calls for a God who cherishes life and protects the innocent and despises the shedding of blood? Now, it's in the book of Psalms where we get this. And um, the Hebrew, if you want to Google the singing, this is in, in Israel. It's a very popular, beautiful song. That's what I love about Israel is like when you're on a bus, there's a sign in Hebrew that says, Mikne Seva Takum, rise for the silver haired. Now, I know some of us are prematurely silver, but silver here means your elders. It doesn't say be nice and give your seat to an old person. It quotes Leviticus 19, just three words. Everybody knows that that's the culture. But this one also. Um, Oh, 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 heavy amim, oh, heavy amim, liotov. It's a beautiful, haunting melody. Mi ha ish. And then the climax is, Nitzor lishon 
חמלה ושפתך מידה במרמה צור מרע ועשה טוב בקה שלום ורודפהו מי האיש And that's the melody. Now you probably, he's singing something I don't know. It's actually the original text for the psalm, which goes, who, amongst you, who among you loves life? Who among you longs to enjoy good for many days? Then guard your tongue from evil and your lips from deceitful speech. Turn away from wrongdoing, from evil. Va'ase tov. And do goodness. And then the word you know, peace. Seek peace, ba'ke shalom, v'rod fehu, and pursue it. So, will we absorb the spirit and message, the big picture, of our scripture and our traditions, which is a call to goodness above everything else. Now, I can't close uh, before saying a word about moms. And um, it relates to goodness. This is also a day to remember motherless daughters and sons It's a day to uh, text friends whose mothers died, children in my congregation for whom this is going to be a very hard day. And um, the Talmud is in awe of the Jewish woman. And I guess all women, but because Jews were segregated, we didn't get to mix like we do today. Jews were unfortunately not embraced. So when the rabbis talk about the Jewish woman, it's only because they didn't have the joy and privilege that I do of getting to know people of other faiths. But they, they're in awe of the woman for unparalleled devotion of her mothering. How mothers have taught goodness, molded society. Uh, if half the world are women, they say, the other half know them as mothers. Uh, and We know about Proverbs 31, when I talked about beauty, a woman of valor who can find, she's more precious than fine jewels. But a lost key to unlocking the concept of motherhood, and I alluded to this when I talked about truth, and this is how we come full circle on truth, beauty, and goodness, is that that word for truth, emet, contains and is derived from the word for mother. The first two letters of truth come from the word for mother. And it's a cluster uh, term or root for so many other, other words in the Bible, like the mother root is the basis for the word for stability, for faith, for integrity, for decency, uh, for goodness. The word tov is good in Hebrew, but it's the root idea of the mother that will give you the end to every blessing you say, whether here or in your sanctuary. When you say amen, it comes from the Hebrew amen, which comes from the word for mother. And so it's clear that God could not be everywhere, so he created mothers. And it's clear that whether we're talking about truth, beauty, or goodness, moms are the source of it all. Thank you very much. So questions.